that can seal the future for calamity or redemption. We've driven God out of our culture, out of our lives. We war against his ways. The only answer is to return in repentance before it's too late. To bring healing, restoration, and revival. Return to God, and he will return to us. Now the keynote moment, a prophetic word to America. Jonathan Kahn. First, I want to commend all of you because most likely your friends and neighbors said, don't go, you can't go, it's too dangerous. But you said, I don't care because I'm here for the Lord. The Lord has called it. They said that you should travel to Washington only for essential things. Well, we consider this to be an essential meeting before the Lord. Before I share, we're gonna move from this point, it's gonna move into the prophetic intercession for America and then for the nations and then for world revival as we move. But this is gonna be the bridge there. And when I finish, we're gonna go as the Lord leads, but then we're, after that, you're gonna have people like Dr. Dobson or the message, Pat Robertson. And I've just been told that there is going to be a surprise that may be very big. Okay, I cannot say anything more. And don't, don't get in your head what it might be, but it's something that might be very important. And so before we begin, those around the world, though again, this centers on America, it has everything to do with you. What happens to America will touch the world and the repentance of one nation is a model for all. And if you came here for a politically correct message, you came to the wrong sacred assembly. Let's pray. Father, I just ask that you would speak, and in my weakness, you would be strong in your power and have your way. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Lord of all. Amen. Two and a half thousand years ago, the prophet Jeremiah stood outside the walls of Jerusalem by the valley of Hinnom. In his hand was a potter's jar like this one, a prophetic symbol of the nation to which he was about to give an ominous warning. The nation Israel had as an earthen vessel been formed by the will of God, by its creator, molded for his purposes. But it turned away from the purposes for which it was created and now was on the verge of destruction. 400 years ago, another civilization was begun, formed and molded for the purposes of the Creator. 400 years ago today, a merchant ship navigated the waves of the Atlantic to make its way to the New World. The ship was called the Mayflower. In November of that year, it landed on the shores of Cape Cod, and its passengers sealed a covenant called the Mayflower Compact. The covenant was embedded in the foundation of this new civilization that would be called America. And in that covenant, the purpose of this new civilization was declared, it was for the glory of God and in the advancement of the faith. Less than 10 years later, another ship crossed the Atlantic, the Arbella. On that ship, the Puritan leader, John Winthrop, issued a prophetic vision of the new civilization he would help to plant. It would be, he said, a city on a hill. The eyes of the world would be upon it. And if it followed the ways of God, then God would bless it and make it the most prosperous, the most powerful, the most secure, the most exalted of civilizations. The blessings of ancient Israel would come upon it. Winthrop's vision would come true. Inasmuch as America strove to follow the ways of God and be a light to the world, it would be blessed. The city on the hill would become as Winthrop foretold the most prosperous, the most secure, the most powerful, revered nation on earth. America would seek to uphold the light of freedom, 
and the sacred value of human life and conscience in the face of tyranny and totalitarianism. It would provide refuge for the world's oppressed and opportunity for the world's impoverished. It would stand against the dark powers that threaten to engulf the earth in the 20th century. The city on the hill would be lifted up and feared and envied and, and emulated and dreamed of and hoped in and looked to by peoples in every nation and land. Then the eyes of the world would be upon it. But Winthrop's vision didn't end there. It led to a prophetic warning. If, he wrote, the city on the hill should turn away from the God of its foundation, then the judgments that fell upon Israel would likewise fall upon it. And what was it that happened to ancient Israel? In the midst of its blessings, the nation turned from God, the God of its foundation. They estranged themselves from him. At first it was a drift, then a departure, and finally a war against his ways. The people drove him out of their hearts, out of their government, out of their ways and lives, out of their education of their children, out of the public square, out of their culture. And as Israel drove him out, the people, they opened up a vacuum. Into that vacuum came a flood of other gods. The gods of prosperity, of comfort, of desire, of carnality, sexual immorality, perversity, and self-obsession. They became their own gods. They overturned his commandments. They disregarded his ways. They redefined truth. They created their own reality. What was evil, they now called good, and what was good, they now called evil. That which they once revered, they now reviled. And that which they once knew to be wrong, they now celebrated. They profaned the sacred, and they sanctified the profane. And so the sanctity of life, they desecrated their children. Their most innocent possession, they now lifted up as sacrifices and shed their blood on the altars of their new gods. And so the blood of their children cried out against them and would call forth their judgment. And it was over that valley where they had sacrificed their children that the prophet Jeremiah stood with a potter's jar in his hand to pronounce his nation's judgment. What about America? America has likewise fallen. In the midst of our blessings and prosperity, we too have turned away from the God of our foundation. We've estranged ourselves from him. And our falling away came the same way, first as a drift, then a departure, and now a war against his ways. We drove God, we drove God out of our hearts, out of our government, out of our ways, out of our laws, out of the education of our children, out of the public squares, out of our businesses, out of our media, out of our culture, out of our lives. And as we drove him out, we opened up a vacuum into which came a flood of other gods. We would not call them gods, but gods they were. Gods of prosperity and comfort and desire and carnality and sexual immorality and self-obsession. And we too have become our own gods. We have overturned the commandments of God. We removed them from the walls of our public square. We redefined truth. We created our own reality. What is evil? We now call good, and what is good, we now call evil. What we once revered, we now revile, and what we once knew to be wrong, we now celebrate. We too have profaned the sacred and have sanctified the profane. And as for our children, our most innocent possession, we have sacrificed them on the altars of self-indulgence. It was here, in this city, over there, it was here that their collective murder was blessed and given sanction. But a thousand laws and a thousand Supreme Court rulings and a thousand angels swearing on a thousand Bibles cannot alter one iota of this basic measure of morality. To shed the blood of an unborn baby is to murder a human life. And the most innocent of human lives. The people of ancient Israel lifted up thousands of their children on the altars of Baal and Moloch. And by doing so, they invoked their own destruction. But we have lifted up millions. And our collective hands are covered with blood. And what does that invoke? 60 million Americans have been murdered. 
And instead of weeping over that fact, we go still farther. It was less than two years ago that in the nation's abortion capital, New York, that, that gruesome law was passed to push the boundaries even farther to murder the unborn child to the point of birth. And when they passed that bloody law, they cheered and they lit up the tower at ground zero in the color pink in celebration. The city on the hill has grown dark. Its light has dimmed and is in danger of going out. It has now been overtaken by a plague that has left it shaken, a lockdown that has battered its economy and paralyzed its daily life, and the sort of disorder and violence that has set it on edge and divided it in two. It's an America that has declared war against its own foundation, a nation its founders would not recognize. An America in which the statue of one of its founders, its first president, after which this city is named, is pulled off its pedestal, wrapped in an American flag, and set on fire. And yet it was that same first president who on the first day of his presidency gave the nation a prophetic warning. He said this, the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. In other words, if America should ever disregard God's eternal rules of order and right, then the smiles of heaven, his blessings, will be removed from this land. And now we have disregarded those eternal rules of order. We war against the order and the nature of man and woman, of gender, of marriage, of life. And we now watch as the smiles of heaven are being removed from the land. We indoctrinate our children against the ways of God. We perform surgery on their bodies to alter their very nature. Are we not doing what the scriptures warned us never to do, to cause these little ones to stumble? And will not the smiles of heaven be removed from the land? We watch as the American flag lies burning in our streets while another flag, that of the rainbow, is lifted up and celebrated as an emblem of pride. But the rainbow does not belong to man, the rainbow belongs to God. And it was not given as an emblem to the pride of man, it was given as a sign of the mercy of God. A mercy given in the face of judgment. But if we turn that sign of mercy against the one who gave it, then when the days of judgment come, what mercy will be left? The word of God stands against all hatred, all oppression, and all injustice against any person, people, nation, color, race, or group. And if you say black lives matter, we agree, surely they do. But how do you say black lives matter and say nothing? Of all the black lives killed in this land before they could even breathe their first breath, how could you be silent before the shed blood of millions of black sons and daughters? How do you not protest all the abortion clinics strategically placed in black neighborhoods for the purpose of destroying black lives? None of these ones can speak the words black lives matter because their lives did not. But if they could, if they could speak, they would ask, why did our black lives not matter? It is for such things that judgment falls on a nation, how then does it fall? The Bible gives a very clear template. Years before that judgment, years before that destruction, it's the nation's hedge of protection is lifted. An enemy is allowed to strike the land. It's a wake-up call, it's a warning, a calling back from God. On September 11, 2001, America's hedge of protection was removed and enemy struck the land and the nation was shaken. The man who warned America of the calamity that would come if it ever turned away from God, John Winthrop, ended up living, dwelling on an island. The ground of Winthrop's island became the ground of Logan Airport. Logan Airport is the very place from which 9-11 would begin and the calamity would fall on America. In the last days of ancient Israel, Nine harbingers, nine signs of warning, of coming judgment appeared in the land, beginning with that first strike. And it was there, I was standing at the corner of Ground Zero when I noticed an object 
It was one of the nine harbingers that appeared in the last days of ancient Israel. It was the beginning of an ancient mystery that would reveal that all the nine harbingers of judgment have appeared in America that appeared in the last days of ancient Israel. It was that mystery that led me to write the harbinger. When judgment came to ancient Israel, the destruction returned to the very ground on which the nation had been committed to God in prayer. The nation's ground of consecration would become its ground of calamity. America was consecrated to God in prayer the day of George Washington's inauguration, the first day as a constituted nation. If we could find out where that took place, we would be able to pinpoint America's consecration ground. It happened in New York City. America was consecrated to God at ground zero. Ground zero is America's consecration ground. The ancient biblical mystery, the calamity returns to the ground of consecration. And on 9-11, a shockwave went forth from ground zero and it struck and it cracked the foundation of the very place where George Washington stood when he gave the nation that prophetic warning, the warning of what would happen if we should ever turn away from God. And the smiles of heaven were removed from the land. In the days after 9-11, Americans flocked to their houses of worship and said, God bless America. And it looked as if there could be a spiritual revival, but the revival never came because there was no repentance, no turning, no return, and without repentance, there can be no revival. When that first strike, that attack of the enemy came upon it, ancient Israel, the nation's leaders responded not with repentance, but proclaiming a vow of defiance. That vow would seal the nation's course to judgment. When 9-11 came to America, the United States Congress gathered the next day right there on Capitol Hill to issue the nation's response. The Senate Majority Leader was appointed to present it at the pinnacle of a speech. He uttered the words of the ancient vow of defiance, the same words that had been spoken by the leaders of ancient Israel in its last days, word for word. He had no idea what he was doing, but he was sealing the nation's course to judgment. And from that moment on, America has been following the footsteps of ancient Israel in its last days as a nation, departing ever farther, descending ever further from the ways of God. In the ancient mystery of judgment, the nation is given a set time to return to God, a span of years beginning with a, that first strike, the enemy attack, and ending with the coming of greater shakings upon it. In the case of Jerusalem, the time of greater shakings came 19 years after that first strike, 19 years the shakings came. In America, the strike came in 2001. So when does the mystery point? What would be the year when the greater shakings come upon the land? 19 years after 9-11 is the year 2020, the year of shakings. And so it has come upon the land. And long before the shakings come, we were led to appoint the year 2020 as the year of the return. And now we stand at this most critical of times, as did ancient Israel when, when Jeremiah looked over the valley of Hinnom with a potter's jar in his hand. And now we stand at the precipice and the crossroads between life and death, calamity or revival, judgment or redemption. We stand in our nation's capital where its future is determined and we cry out, yes. Supreme Court justices, you open up your sessions with the word, God save this Supreme Court. But if you overrule the rulings of God, if you judge the judgments of God, if you strike down the eternal precepts of God, then how can God save your court? Know then there stands a court that is much higher and there sits a judge who is much more supreme. And before his judgment, all judges will stand and give account. Members of Congress, leaders of the land, you sing, God bless America. But if you forge and execute laws that disregard the laws of heaven and war against them, then how can God bless America? Know then there is a greater magistrate and a higher lawgiver, and his laws are eternal. And by them all rulers and lawgivers will be judged. Pastors, ministers, spiritual leaders, shepherds of the land, 
You stand as representatives of God, but if you dilute his word, if you compromise it, alter it, turn it in against itself, if you consecrate sin and bless what God has judged, if you sanctify the darkness, then will you not be held accountable for the sheep you have misled? There is a great shepherd, and before him all shepherds will stand, and by his word will be judged. People of this land, and of all lands, if you partake in this present darkness, if you do nothing to stand against it, if you give your approval and lend your support and cast your vote to those rulers and those agendas that advance the darkness, that war against the ways of God, that shed the blood of innocent children, then how can you not invoke the judgment of God upon your land, your nation, and upon your own life? We stand at the crossroads today between two altars and two destinies. And as the voice of Elijah called out to his nation in ancient times and now cries out to America, how long, how long, America, will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, then serve him. But if Baal is God, then serve him and go to hell. Two and a half thousand years ago, the prophet Jeremiah stood with a potter's jar in the capital city of his nation. The jar, a symbol of that nation formed by God's hand, molded for his purpose and appointed as his vessel. But the nation had forgotten those purposes and now warred against them. How then could it stand? 400 years ago, Today, the Mayflower sailed through the waters of the Atlantic and a new civilization was brought into being and formed as a consecrated vessel for the purposes of the Almighty. But that vessel, America, has also forgotten the purpose for which it was formed and now wages war against them. How then can it stand? And how can God bless a nation that wars against his ways, that blasphemes his name, that silences his word and vilifies those who uphold it, that sheds the blood of over 60 million of its children. Can the smiles of, a, of heaven remain upon it? They cannot. Such things only lead to judgment. God told the prophet Jeremiah, take that vessel and show it before the people. And then... Smash the vessel. For if a nation's course remains unchanged, so too will its end. For a house divided, a house that wars against its own foundation, cannot remain standing. And that is why we have come to this ground on the 26th day of September 2020 and have gathered all over America and the world because the hour is late and the moment is critical. We've come here to stand before God, to intercede for this nation as never before and seek his mercy as never before. We have come here because God has given this promise. Yet still, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And there is a context to that promise. It appears in the previous verse, the context is the coming of a plague upon the land. Well, the plague has come. And so too has come the time to return. We have come to this ground to humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our evil ways. We have come here to return. We've come here to seek his mercy that we would not pass the point of no return. For God longs not to judge but to save, to forgive, to heal, to redeem, and to revive. For without revival, America is lost. And we've come here not only for a nation, but for all and for each, because we each are destined for eternity. And we will each stand before him on the day of judgment. 
black and white, man and woman, old and young, liberal and conservative, right wing and left wing, Jew and Gentile, Catholic and Protestant, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, atheist, those who uphold his word and those who fight against it of every nation, tribe and tongue. Because when all conflicts have ceased, when all issues have faded, when, when all culture wars are over, and when all nations and history have passed away and it's all just a memory, we will each stand before him on the day of judgment. And what then will our hope and salvation be? The word for salvation in Hebrew is Yeshua. And Yeshua is the English name of Jesus. In English is Jesus. So it was written in ancient times, there is no other name that is named by which we must be saved. And now, 2,000 years later, it's just as true. And that name is just as exalted. And even more so than it was then, kingdoms have risen and fallen, empires have ascended and crumbled, but the name of Yeshua, Jesus, has outlasted them all and remains as alive and powerful now as it was then. The history of this planet is divided in two, before him and after him. Every date of every nation, every moment of every life is marked by how near or how far it is from the moment of his birth, the birth of a Jewish baby, an itinerant rabbi named Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. No matter who we are or when or where we are, and this is going to all the world, we cannot run from his presence. His life shines over every corner of this world, over every moment of our life. For he is the hope given for every life and the answer to the cry of our hearts. He is Yeshua, the salvation of God and the only way through which we can return. Yeshua, Jesus, the love of God who took upon himself our judgment, who gave up his life for our sins and who in his rising overcame death so we could be saved and find everlasting life. For God did so love the world that he did give his only begotten son that whoever... Whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He is Yeshua who says to you now, come to me and I will not turn you away. And that brings us to one last mystery. The mystery that lies behind this very day and this very gathering. When this day was chosen for the return, nobody realized, no one had any idea. It turned out that this day was a sacred day set apart on the biblical Hebrew calendar. From ancient times, it is called Shabbat Shubah. Shabbat means the Sabbath, that Saturday, which is right now. But the key word is Shubah. What does it mean? Shubah means the return. The return. This day was appointed from ancient times to be the day of the return. This day was specifically consecrated as the day of repentance and return to God for the return of a nation, the return of all and each. And there is a word appointed. Whoa. And don't worry, I'm not going to smash this. There's a word appointed today to be read from ancient times. It is this. Tiku shofar bitzion kadzu tsom kiru atzara. What does it mean? Blow the shofar. Declare a holy fast. Proclaim a solemn assembly. Call together the people for a solemn assembly. That's what it says. Gather the elders, gather the ministers. Let the ministers weep and say, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on your people. Well, we are now, yeah, yeah, go, go. The spirit's moving. moment. This is a prophetic moment. We are now standing in that assembly, that solemn assembly, and today in every part of this planet, 
in the synagogues of the children of Israel, the scrolls are being opened by the rabbis to that very scripture, and they're proclaiming all over the world, proclaim a solemn assembly. Plead for God's mercy, and we are that, and we had no idea. It was all the hand of God, and so none of us are here standing on this ground or together with us across the nation and the world by accident. All this was appointed in the eternal purpose of God before any of us were born. This day was destined to be the day of the return, and we each were destined to be here. It is the day appointed for a nation and for his people to stand before him. And the voice of God is calling out, return, 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 return America. For you have fallen in your iniquity, return America while it is still yet day. And there is set before you life and death. Choose life and not destruction. Return America and I will have mercy on you, and I will be your peace, and I will give healing for your wounds. And to you who have not known me but have fallen away, the Lord says, return to me and I will take you back. And to you who have warred against my ways, even now, even you come to me and I will receive you. And you who have lived in the darkness of immorality and impurity and you've been defiled, come to me and I will cleanse you. And you who have partaken in the darkest of your nation's sin, and you have lived in the burden of guilt and shame, come to me and I will wash you and I will remove your guilt and the shame of your youth. And you who are imprisoned in the chains of bondage, come to me and I will set you free. And you who are dwelling now in fear and gloom, come to me, I will be your light and your shelter. You, the rejected, the abandoned, the abused, the oppressed, the outcast, the broken, return to me, says the Lord, and I will not reject you, but I will be your healing. And you, my people, who are called by my name, return to me to your first love and to the devotion of your youth. Put away that which must be put away and rise to that to which you must rise. Do not fear man. Do not fear the darkness around you. But shine forth at the light I called you to be, and I will be with you always. Today, September 26, 2020, the day of the return, the voice of God is calling to a nation, America, return, and to the nations of the world, return, and to everybody who has ears now to hear his voice, return, for my arms are open, return to me, and I will return to you. Has America past the point of no return, what lies ahead? Judgment and calamity or return and revival? It can be both. It can be that through shaking, that revival comes. Did you hear that? It can be through shaking that revival comes. And that's not our sound effects. And through the shaking, through the darkening, through darkness that comes the light and through the shaking of a nation's power and the darkening of its light that the radiance of God's light might dawn and the fire of his spirit might blaze. And when the darkness comes and the night falls, it is then that the people of God must shine as lights into the darkness and stars into the night. That's you. We began this sacred assembly. The voice of the Lord is like thunder. We began this sacred assembly on the appointed day with the word appointed for the day, the second chapter of Joel, which began as was written. We began as it was written with the sounding of the shofar and the gathering of his people and the elders and the priests, God's minister, to come before the Lord and repentance. But what does that word that's appointed for today, what does that word and that repentance and that sacred gathering lead to? It leads to this. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh your sons and daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams I will pour out my spirit in those days and I will show wonders in the heavens the heavens and in the earth that is what it all leads to we know that in the last days darkness must come but this too must come God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Revival must come, and how must it come?
The word appointed for this day reveals it. Revival must come through repentance. And why are we here today? Because this is the day appointed for the return, Shabbat Shuvah. And the word Shuvah not only means the return, it also means the repentance. And it's repentance that brings revival. Could it be that we are here to be given a chance to light not only the spark of revival in America, but of the end time revival, the revival of nations? For this sacred assembly is spanning the world. We are joined today sisters throughout the earth, one in spirit, one in purpose, repentance, return, and revival. And if revival must begin with prayer and repentance, then let it begin here and now on the day of the return. Let us here highly resolve that we will from this moment forth live, live as we were called to live according to the high purpose for which we were placed, which you were placed in your mother's womb for such a time as this. And whatever is not worthy of that calling, we hereby renounce. Let us highly resolve that we will not only pray for revival, as we have never prayed before, but that will also actually live in revival as we have never lived before. And if we do so, then revival will begin here and now. For the eyes of the Lord are searching the entire earth, looking for the one, looking for the one, looking for the people, the looking for the one whose heart is completely his, and he will show himself mighty for them. You be that one, let us be that people, and then revival will come. And if the days of darkness must come, then let them come, for they will not overcome the light of God, but will only magnify it. And if the, words, the world should go from bad to worse, then it's time for you, the people of God, to go from good to great. Yeah. And if the darkness grows yet darker, it's time for the lights of God to shine brighter. For we are no longer the candle of the day. We are now the candle of the night that shines against the darkness and lights up the world with its radiance. The same light that once lit up the world 2,000 years ago. For if the nation of Israel has returned where it once was at the beginning of the age, back to the land, then it's time for the people of Messiah, the people of God, to return where they once were at the beginning of the age, to the book of Acts. And on the day of the return, it's time for the people of God to return to that same power, that same calling, that same anointing, that same glory, that they might again light up the world. It is time to live unhindered, uncompromised, unbound, bold, all out, on fire, and mighty in the power of the living God. It is time to rise. It is time to return. For thus says the Lord, call to me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things you know not of. Prepare, prepare, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be brought low. Let every crooked way be made straight. Let every rough way be made smooth. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And the rains of the latter days will come down upon the earth. And the Spirit of God poured upon the nations. For thus says the Lord, Kumi, Ori, Kiva, Orech, Oru. Arise and shine, says the Lord. Arise and shine, says the Lord. For your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Deep darkness shall cover the earth, but the glory of the Lord shall rise upon you in the name above every name, the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus the Messiah, the way, the truth, the life, the King of Kings, the Lord of all, the hope of the age, the Prince of life, the light of the world, the star of Jacob, and the glory of Israel, and the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. Amen.